Hey, Pool Chasers. On today's episode, we are once again going to share a panel discussion from the International Pool Spa and Patio Show this year. It is a live recording, so the audio can fade in and out a little bit depending on where the guests were sitting. But with consolidation being such a big topic in 2022, we thought the conversation between the big three had some great insight for all to hear. Without further ado, this is episode 228 with Augusto, Hal, Gary, Wendy, Fraser, and Mike. Enjoy! Welcome to your go-to podcast for the pool and spa industry. My name is Tyler Rasmussen. And my name is Greg Diafania. And this is the Pool Chasers Podcast. Experts. These are our experts right here. I'm Megan from Pool Pro Magazine. Um, so I guess just to get started, well, I'm going to have you guys introduce yourselves. We'll start all the way down at the end with Augusto. All right. Um, my name is Augusto Tiarelli. I am the CEO of NPP. Um, NPP was founded about um, t- two years ago. Uh, we're in the third year of operation right now. And it was founded on the idea that we could uh, uh, evolve and uh, make this industry better. And that's what we've been trying to pursue so far. Uh, my name is Hal Dinbar, and uh, currently president of operations for National Pool Partners. Um, started in the industry the week I graduated from college after having a, uh, a job cleaning pools my, my last semester of college. Spent five years uh, just me in a truck as a, a one puller, uh, and I've had the, the really, I think, cool, unique opportunity to perform every job really there is in pool service from a single owner operator for, for many years to eventually scaling it to be uh, at the time the largest residential pool service provider in Austin, Texas. Uh, and then in 2020, connected with Augusto and, and, and one of our board members, Matt Stevenson. And we created what at that point was just the idea of what NPP would become and uh, launched National Pool Partners and uh, had fun running the state of Texas for a, a short period of time. And, and now I'm focused on, on our whole national operation. Good morning. I'm Gary Creighton with Pool Troopers. Uh, We've been in business since 1952. Um, I've been in the business since I was 12 years old, so I'm not going to tell you how long that's been, but it's been a really long time. Um, And we're just incredibly excited to be here and give you all the opportunity to ask us questions because um, that's one of the things that that we find out when we're talking to to companies um, is that I don't feel that they ask enough questions up front. Um, and so this is, I'm, I'm incredibly honored to be here with y'all and, and share this open forum. And I'm Wendy Parker Barcel. I do business development for pool troopers. Um, I grew up in the pool industry. My father was a contractor and I joined pool troopers about 18 months ago. Prior to that, I worked for the Florida Swimming Pool Association as their executive director and I was there for 20 years. So I have been involved in the pool industry my whole life as well. Nice. Uh, Fraser Ramsey, founder and CEO of Smart Pool Services, which we've now rebranded to SPS Pool Care. Uh, founded it with the vision of elevating the industry as a whole, see a lot of opportunity for all stakeholders, people who work in it, people who own businesses in it, and uh, ultimately the customers as well who receive the pool care. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to answer any and all questions. Hello, uh, Mike Cohen. Um, I am the head of partnerships at uh, SPS Pool Care. Um, recently, I'm a pool guy. Um, I took my company in Scottsdale, Arizona uh, with a dream, just me and a truck, uh, as Hal built his company there. And uh, we became the largest uh, residential um, pool cleaning company in Scottsdale. We had 3,000 accounts. Um, I'm 52 years old and I was thinking about exit strategy, what I want to do with my life and do something a little bit different. Um, Fortunately, I met Fraser here. came in, we met in late April. In about two months, we ended up partnering and closing in my business from the day that I spoke with him to the day that we closed. Um, This company is amazing, uh, great people. Uh, It's infectious to work with this guy. And so it's been a great experience for me. And I feel that I really elevated the pool industry with my company. And now we get to take it to, to another level. And I think that's what all of us up here are trying to do. So we're going to start off by, I'll ask them a few questions to kind of get us started, and then if you guys have some questions, we'll, we'll take some questions from you as well. Um, 
So I think just to start off, you know, there's a lot of, I can see different ages in this, in here, you know, people probably have different levels of their career, different times in their career. So what does this look like? So if you want to sell your business, what does that look like? Are you approaching them? Are they approaching you? If they have interest, should they reach out? Like, what does that look like? And how does that process just even get started? Go ahead, Fraser. Sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah, a combination of both. I think initially it was uh, creating awareness in the industry um, to uh, people who built pool companies. I think, you know, Hal, for example, built a large, strong company, and there were a few... You know, Hal's young, so he's not the norm for getting that large so quickly, but uh, there wasn't really an exit opportunity for a lot of people if, uh, if you couldn't handle it down through generations. And so what was created is, one, an exit opportunity, two, the opportunity to join forces and um, build something greater. And um, that kind of uh, filtered down into also the opportunity if you are a smaller company and you have 300 pools, 500 pools, or a route, the opportunity to sell to someone else outside of a national pool route sales, kind of brokering a deal, the opportunity to take equity in something greater and be a part of transforming the industry. Um, I think as that wave started to happen with the three of us, um, now people are reaching out to all of us, uh, which is pretty exciting. And so anyone can feel free, you know, from our side to reach out to Mike, myself. I think my cell phone is on the website. Um, I'm happy to talk to you and we'll take you through the process. Um, the process on our side is uh, you reach out to us, um, we'll sign a mutual NDA to protect you and your information, um, then we'll send you a real quick information sheet to fill out that gives us the, the basics around your business, um, at which point uh, we can give you uh, insight into what evaluation would look like, and then we'll go through a slightly deeper due diligence process of getting the last three years of your P&Ls, tax returns, payroll reports, things like that, just to understand uh, the profitability of your business and the opportunity um, of it joining us. And then we give you evaluation um, through a letter of intent. We negotiate back and forth, find something that's fair. And then once we sign that, it's typically a five-week process, six-week process to go through um, an integration process and due diligence process, which is critical that it's done right, because that's when the day of close, all your employees are essentially hired by us. Um, so we want to make sure they get paid right, paid on time, onboarded correctly, correct titles, correct positions, and so on. Um, then we close the deal, and then it's on a journey together. Okay, that's great. Does anyone else have something to add to that? Yeah, and Fraser did a really good job there explaining, you know, the process. And all the processes are probably pretty similar. Um, one of the things we require is, is meeting face-to-face -face, uh, in that process. We want to make sure there's a good cultural fit. Um, and if, if an owner is exiting, um, we want to meet the next person in line, right? You're, you're number one, you're number two, because it's going to be key for us to keep that person in place, th those people in place, that team in place, for us to have success. And success is measured by keeping the clients and keeping the employees, right? If we don't keep the employees, we can't keep the clients and vice versa. So. Um, it's incredibly important for us that we have that face-to-face -face interaction. So that's probably an additional thing, and he probably just left that out. We're all a little nervous up here, so um, <laughs> I'm sure everyone does that. The other thing is, is to answer the specific question, it happens both ways. We will go out and solicit companies that we know of or hear about or really find uh, attractive in a particular market, and or you all can obviously reach out to any of us or all of us in this process. Um, and so both things are happening all the time. Um, and, and so we don't get leads from any one particular source. It's, it's sometimes we have a friend in the industry that says, hey, I know this guy and he wants to retire. Um, and that happens or, or y'all just call us and, and, and we start up a, a relationship, so. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. No, uh, no I, was just, I was just going to add, uh, we, we like to look uh, personally at the companies, uh, same process as you guys follow, and we've been developing a lot, um, direct uh, contact with the companies, understanding their operational processes. Uh, what we found is that the successful integration and in keeping the promises that you make during an acquisition process depends a lot on how well you're able to integrate that operation into your new way of operating, right? So that's just one other thing that we've been, over the past year, focusing a lot more on. 
is can we operate that business successfully, retain the talent, retain the people, and man maintain the value that we acquired. So a, a, a key process in the integration is preserving the value that you, that you acquired, right? And that depends a lot of how um, able you are to bring those businesses together in a harmonious way, right? So that's just one thing that we're paying a lot of attention to recently. So. And, and we definitely, it's very much a two-way street, as, as they mentioned, in terms of, you know, we, we might go out and, and start talking to companies proactively, but I think with all three of us, it's, it's super important that <laughs> if folks are interested in, in M&A and, and exiting their business, that you start a conversation with all of us, because What's really interesting in this industry is there are some massive companies that are just completely under the radar that we could none of us could go find even if we wanted to. I mean, there are companies servicing thousands of pools that don't even have a website, um, and so it's it's a really you know unique part of the industry. The fact that there are companies that big that have not done a lot of promotion where, where somebody like us would, would be able to find them to know that the, to even just present the opportunity <coughs> to exit. And it was also really interesting. I think as as all of us were probably starting this journey a couple of years ago. Uh, like Fraser mentioned, in terms of sort of like my age, um, when we started talking about uh, the idea of national pool partners in, in early 2020, um, it was you know I was I was in my mid 30s. I had no intention of exiting my company, of selling my business. Uh, that was so far off my radar and so far in the future um, that you know I hadn't even considered sort of what options would be out there. And and one thing that was really eye opening to me in the process. Um, because as, as they were, you know, Augusto and Matt were talking to me saying, well, hey, come, come help us, like, create what this idea could be. Um, my first question was, like, why are you talking to me? Um, I'm, I'm in my mid-30s, you know, I'm just sort of, like, figuring this thing out as I'm going. And what was, what was interesting is they said, well, normally, uh, if you go to consolidate an industry and, and start something big, let's go find the, the gray-haired, gray wise industry veteran who's been there, done that, built a multi-million dollar business, um, and let's hire that person to come consult for us and, and at the idea stage create what this can be. And the next piece was what was surprising. They're like, we can't find that in, in the full service industry. Like if you have built a, a really large business um, that, that, that should be valuable, there's no big strategic buyer out there waiting to buy that business. Um, and so, you know, we're coming to, to talk to you because what traditionally happens in an industry where you have that opportunity to, to cash the check, go sit on the beach and, and hang it up, really wasn't available to us as an industry. Or if it was, it was, a, it was in a very, very small way. Um, so that's been one of the, the cool things, I think, for all three of us, is being able to present that opportunity to the industry uh, in a way that it just hadn't existed prior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, also to, to talk a little bit about that, I mean, I was building my company in Scottsdale and throughout the years it's like I have 500 pools, 1,000, who's going to buy me? You know, you, you see all kind of routes for sale, you know, 300 here. I mean, I was actually um, uh, buying those myself and I just never could figure out, you know, who I could put, potentially sell to. And so when all of a sudden this happened, I realized uh, this was my time to exit and uh, also to expound on the experience of getting to know the business and, and making sure it's a cultural fit, as everybody mentioned. Um, you know, Smart Pools came in and met with all my people, um, and it's been such a wonderful experience. Nobody in my business has gone backwards, okay? Everybody's making the same amount of money, um, enjoying uh, the culture still there, and my culture really fit the culture of uh, Smart Pools. And I was always leading taking care of my people and there was always upward mobility um, but to what extent you know how you know do I take my 3,000 pulls to 6,000 pulls you know what when do I decide you know that I, I, I stop and and uh, this ended up being the perfect time for me and my partnership and all my employees are so excited because as we grow because this is just the beginning um, I've trained these guys. They've trained under my, my branch manager who took over. And uh, they're just excited for other opportunities as we open up other flagships in, in different cities or different parts of Phoenix. Um, so uh, I, I, just, I just speak from after the fact. I mean, I'm only into this for four and a half months since I sold. And I still want to be here. I want to be up here talking to you and saying that this could be a great experience for you. It really has been for me every 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 uh, step of the way and uh, so if you are looking 
to uh, sell or partner, it's, it's definitely worth um, looking into. Yeah, that's one, one uh, <clears throat> I think Mike brought, brought up a good point as we are talking about process of what it looks like. Mm -hmm. One of the key critical points, um, and you guys touched on a little bit, is the staff announcement. So obviously people's biggest concern is their, is their employees. It's like the family they've built. They fear for them and um, what it's going to look like for them. We're all of us, I know, are here to support the sellers in that and in communicating what's happening to the employees. So we'll plan a staff announcement, help them through that, and then be on site to meet with every single employee, walk them through benefits packages and things like that, just to show them the vision of the future for them personally and why this is a positive thing for them. And I'm glad you guys brought up that, um, you know, Hal and, uh, and Mike are both staying in the business because we talk about this a lot as being um, an exit strategy, but it doesn't have to be either. You know, you could be at a point in your business where you um, are, want to grow more and just don't have the resources and capital to do that, and, or you are ready to do something else in your career or work in a different capacity <laughs> instead of being the business owner, and this gives you the opportunity to do something new, to not leave the industry, and to still, um, you know, like you said, take care of your people. Um, and that's, I mean, that kind of makes me wonder, is that, are you, are you looking for people who are leaving or staying or a good mix of both? I mean, you guys have gone through quite, all of you have gone through quite a few of these at this point. That's a great question. So, um, obviously if we're entering a new territory and, and just historically, obviously I, I sold my business in October to the private equity firm Shoreline Equity, that, that's our private equity partner. Um, so I've been through that process, right? So it really helps me communicate with, with pool service companies and, and just onto the motivating factor of, of one of the reasons why is, is going back to when my father was running the business and, and I would see his compatriots, his, his peers sell their business to either their children or a service manager or someone like that. And two or three years later, they'd be back in the business, out of retirement, having to run their own business back again, right? Because that that process failed. The, the children didn't run it right, or something like that. And and so that awkwardness, that lack of dignity in able to transition your business, is was one of the motivating factors of of why we put together what we did with with Shoreline and, and said, look, we we need to we need to be doing this for our industry. And, and it's incredibly important to me, obviously, this industry has been great to my family over the years, I've been in it for a long time. So um, to the specific question about the transitioning, um, and I'm sorry, I, I, I got off on a tangent. Staying or leaving. <laughs> staying or leaving. Yeah, stay, staying or leaving. Yeah, there is a lot to talk about. And and again, I, I'm a little bit nervous up here with y'all, but and I don't know why, because I, I, I like being, uh, I like talking to pool people. Um, staying or leaving, we deal with both situations all the time, right? There's, there's obviously people that are at the end of their journey and, and they want to transition out and they don't have a succession plan. Um, they don't have a son or daughter that's going to come in and take over the business. Um, and that's understandable. The important thing in that situation, if you're in that situation, if you're in that boat, the best advice I can give you is make yourself redundant. All right, if you're out there doing all the work, it, it's hard for us to come in as an acquirer and replace you if you haven't already done that yourself. So the very best advice, and I, I think I speak for all of us at that point, is make yourself redundant. Um, if you're a young person um, and you want, or I, I'm older, right? I'm older than all these guys, um, and I'm still in it, right? So you don't have to be young. You just have to still want to be in it. You still have to have the passion. If you still have the passion to be in it, I don't care what your age is, we're happy to have you on the team, right? We can't do what any of us want to do ourselves. Fraser's not cleaning pools. I'm not cleaning pools. Hal's not cleaning pools anymore. We're not doing that. What we're doing is putting together a team that's out there building great organizations. And that's our goal. That's our desire. And we can't do that without great people and without great pool people. That's what we all need. So great pool people, if you're passionate about it still, regardless of age, 
and want to be part of the team and want to be part of, of that growth plan, then we want you on the team. That's, that's the basics of it. And so we deal with both, people that are exiting, people that want to stay. Um, in general, if we're entering a new territory, we absolutely want to do that with someone who wants to stay. Um, we tried it with in a new territory with people who wanted to exit, and we kind of stubbed our toe a little bit. Um, and so we've made a, a corporate decision that if we're entering a new territory, a new space geographically, um, then we absolutely want to have a partner who's going to stay. Yeah, I think one of the key things, obviously, we as we acquire companies, we look for talent. That that is a key element that we ascribe value to, right? At the same time, we need to be very, very careful not to frustrate expectations, right? And mostly for the operational talent, it's very easy because that's a functional thing. You're just incorporating. You know, if you're a service uh, manager, you're becoming a service manager, particularly if you go into a new territory. For owners. Um, most businesses have been built by entrepreneurs that have to go to a new mode to operate, to join a company. That, that's a big transition. That's a, that's a mind shift that, that we have to be extremely careful not to frustrate. And a way to do this is really understand what the new role, if you're staying with the business, what's your new role, what you're going to be doing, what your attributions are, is that really what you want uh, for continuity? Um, and we've, again, in some cases, have stubbed our toes in situations where that clarity didn't, didn't exist. And so we'll, we'll, we'll adjust the organization, try to fit something. And it's a force fit. It, it, doesn't, re, it doesn't hold in, in the future, right? So there is a lot of soul searching that has to happen in that process when we start discussing the hierarchy that's going to exist after that integration, what the roles are, midterm, short term, and long term, right? And you have to be brutally honest about what that is and what expectations are. Otherwise, you're going to frustrate people and destroy value. So that's very important. And we need to make sure that that is respected through the acquisition process. So that discussion has to happen through the acquisition process. And that clarity has to be provided. In situations where we were not able to provide that clarity, it never led to a good uh, outcome. And so it's something that we learned as well. Have those hard discussions. Um, and those are difficult conversations uh, sometimes, but they're very crucial for the continuity of what you've built. Yeah, and it's, it's all about mutual fit. And, and I think where, where the industry is in a really good place right now is there's three really strong options um, that, that have you know, good people leading them that, that are they're doing it the right way where that mutual fit can be found. Um, you know, because as you, as you come in as a seller, if you are wanting to, to stick around, it's all about, okay, what, what is it you're looking to do? Do we have that available? Is that something we're looking to do? If not, who does? Um, so, you know, the, the, the really good thing is there are options. And, and the more options there are, the better it is for everybody um, to find that mutual fit where everybody's going to succeed and be happy in what they're doing. Yeah. I'd like to underscore something that, you, that um, Gary said, which is if you're the product that's being sold, your valuation is going to be low. Now, so the redundancy that you were, I, we find that to be also very important. Businesses that are utterly dependent to functionally on the leaders that built it tend to have more difficult to be integrated successfully with people. So that's something if you're thinking about <coughs> that, um, make sure that all processes run outside of the scope of authority that you have directly in the business. You guys should actually make yourself redundant and know, know thyself. And the more you can actually demonstrate that everything is working, the better off you're going to be in terms of approaching any of these companies with confidence. Says, hey, I, I, this is what I want to do. I want you to consider my company. And the, these are the structures that ascribe value to my business. Right? So that's very important, I think. Yeah, I think um, some great points there. And as Hal said, there's three of us. We always encourage people to talk to all of us. Um, we'll say you talk to MPP, talk to Putrovers, talk to us, because... As Augusto said, you've got to find the right fit. You've got to do a lot of soul searching um, because it is, it is a new way of operating when you sell. You know, people are used to making all of the decisions, and there still is a lot of decision-making autonomy, but there's just guardrails now um, because if you want to elevate the industry, there's standards and a new way of doing things when you join uh, one of us. 
Um, however, I think the, one of the very exciting things about what we're doing is we're creating new opportunities for people within the pool industry. So for example, Mike being our head of partnerships now, that's probably not something he ever thought about doing when he was selling his business, but this opportunity is here. He found it and he found that he loves it and it's what gives him a lot of fire. Um, in life now, and um, there's director of technical operations, there's recruiting, there's integration. Uh, different people from uh, different sellers have joined different departments of our business and uh, have a lot of runway for growth now. And so um, just to elaborate on that, I think it's uh, an opportunity, but definitely uh, a time where you put a lot of thought into it, you get a lot of clarity, know yourself. Um, but lastly on that, nothing is set in concrete. So if you make a mistake and you get into something you're not enjoying it, you can always change that. And, and, and to Fraser's last point about nothing set in concrete, like one of the most fun things right now, uh, and I think this definitely applies to all three of us because we're all still such young companies, uh, and, and we're an industry that is 100% entrepreneurial, really, at, at this point, and, and, you know, it always has been, is we're all still in the build phase. So, you know, folks that are coming in and, and joining our teams right now, like we're all building what the future uh, of, of our companies and you know potentially this industry is going to be, uh, and so it's been it's super fun to be in at this early stage that we all are to help shape what what that future could look like. Um, and so you know for the entrepreneurial nature that I think all of us brought in um, to start companies in this industry, uh, it's still carrying through with what we're all doing right now. We're going to take a quick break. When we get back, the panelists answer the tough question that most people have: Why is consolidation a good thing, and how does it affect my business? This episode is brought to you by Leslie's. Leslie's continues to deliver for pool trade professionals by providing benefits no one else can offer. The Leslie's Pro Partner Program can help you grow your business through referrals while also providing their most exclusive pricing and best-in-class warranties on equipment. The Leslie's Pro Partner Program is for pros looking to build a true partnership with their supplier. Stop by your local Leslie's to learn how you can become a pro partner today or check out episodes 151 and 165 of the podcast for more details. This episode of the Pool Chasers podcast is also brought to you by Raypack. Stop sacrificing durability or efficiency with the help of Raypack's new Avia HD models that utilize NITEC, their exclusive industry-first technology. NITEC Heat Exchange Technology is Raypack's latest solution to superior strength and maximum efficiency when it comes to residential pool heating. With 900% more nickel compared to cooper nickel in critical surfaces, NITEC creates an ideal surface to protect against scale formation and erosion without compromising on Avia's 84% thermal efficiency. To learn more, visit raypack.com forward slash NITEC or check out episode 224 of the podcast. This episode of Pool Chasers podcast is also brought to you by The Attendant. The Attendant, powered by Poolside Tech, is the latest in pool automation. Their system offers innovative features and applied intelligence to help it think and communicate with both pool pros as well as the homeowner. It offers features such as syncing your DMX lights to Spotify, built-in water leveling, dirty filter detection, and my favorite, Airbnb mode, which allows a pool owner to grant access to users with restrictions to specific pool features or defining set points for heating events. User access can also expire at a specific time. Best of all, the attendant is vendor agnostic, so it's compatible with the equipment from existing manufacturers on the market today. Learn more at poolside.tech or check out episode 194 of the podcast. So I think I have one last question and then let's throw it off to the audience if you guys don't mind. Um, so I've kind of been operating under the assumption that everyone in here is, um, you know, might be interested in selling their business. But that might not be true, right? There might be people, be people in here who are thinking, like, who are these guys? And what are they doing to my industry? <laughs> and is this a good thing or a bad thing? Um, you know, change can, be, change can be hard. And, you know, if you want to remain a business owner and continue to grow your business, you know, are these consolidators going to make it impossible for you to be as successful as you as you think you can be or want to be? So, I mean, so there's there's the tough question. <laughs> yeah. So I, I love to to address that because I come, to, to, I, I spent the previous five years before I joined NPP running operations for Terminex, right? And Terminex, just to give you an idea, the pest control business is about a nine billion dollar business. Pool cleaning, just the cleaning part, is about six. The two largest companies, and this has changed recently, in pest control 
control about five billion dollars of the nine. So that's an industry that's been through this aggregation process started by 20 years ago. That what we're going through is something that they've, they've been through for the past 20 years. And what I learned in that industry, there's always going to be a role for the large aggregators, mid-sized players, and individual uh, businesses. That's never going to go away. If you look at the, the footprint of that highly consolidated industry, you find a role that is absolutely necessary for each one of these categories. And there is, there is wisdom in the fact that if you aggregate, and as you aggregate, you protect the industry, which means you have to make things better for those who sold, but for those that didn't sell as well, and preserve all layers of that industry. That's when value is created. That means money flows into the industry when every single category evolves. And that's very important. So an example of that, um, when we started dealing last year with inflation, right, um, we all saw sectoral inflation of 30, 40%, right? Uh, we went through a, a, a very, very uh, strict exercise about what do we need to do to repricing to uh, actually face off this, this threat. This was, it was a threat, you know, threatening the, the profit of the company. And we went through all this math, and we figured, look, look you know what? I can't keep this to ourselves. We need to share this. And we actually published a, a, um, a calculator that we made it open to the industry because you can't just think of yourself. Because there are certain things that you can do to improve your business, but if the industry doesn't improve alongside it, it doesn't work. So we, we as aggregators have this mentality. <coughs> you have to be part of a good industry. And you cannot just be a great operator in a bad industry. The industries that really, really do well, everyone goes up. When we talk about elevating the industry, we're dead serious about that. We really want to make sure that whether you sold it or not, you're doing good quality business. And if you look, for example, at the value that some other service industries have already gotten for their customers for the level of service we provide, this is an industry that has not yet conquered its place in the home services industry, right? So I come from the pest control industry where you're charging $120, $150 per service and you show up once every three months, right? And virtually same caliber of people, just about the same amount of time. Why is it that people pay that respect to a certain industry and not ours? The way we're going to create value is not just creating value for our companies. We'll need to create value for the whole company as, as the whole industry evolves and is respected, everyone's boat is floated by the same time. So we don't think of ourselves as a threat, and we have lived up to that. I mean, so there are points where we actually shared stuff with other competitors, make sure that people, hey, look at this. The whole industry needs to do something about that. Yeah. Right. And, and we're I, always, all of those stratas continue to exist in the future. And coming from the association side, so I was with the association for a long time, which means I got to know a lot of pool guys for a lot of years, and um, one of the things that kept, has kept me in this business is the entrepreneurial spirit of pool companies, right? You guys build these companies, you hire your employees, you keep the industry going, and there is going to be a place for everybody in this somehow, whether you want to keep growing your business, want to be part of one, of one of what we're doing, but that's what's exciting about being in this right now is it's, it's, it's all moving up. It's all moving up, and it's exciting, and I talk to friends of mine who say, Wendy, we'll never do that, but you're helping us. You're helping us get our rates up and get and improve the quality of what's happening in the field. So there's a place for everybody in this as we move forward. And I mean, Wendy can speak from personal experience, but when her father was ready to retire, he just let his company go. I mean, that was that was the option that he had. Um, it just faded away, and incredibly sad, right? Um, and and not. It, you know, not to get too personal, but when my dad wanted to retire, I was the succession plan, right? Um, and it was made known to me as a child, you're going to do this, right? And whether I wanted to or not, and thankfully I love our industry and I wanted to be here, and, and so it worked out, but that's not really something, and that's exactly the reason why my children 
don't work full time in our in my business. Right? I was never going to put them under that level of pressure and stress to be the source of funding for my retirement. Okay, I don't believe that's a dignified way to to treat your own children. Um, and I don't begrudge my dad doing that. Is maybe a generational thing and and just something that was expected at the time. But that's, that was my personal story, and I know that story's not, not new to anybody in here. We all know somebody that was in that situation. We've all seen that in our industry, we, and I alluded to it before. We've all also seen my generation fail, and that older generation have to come back into the business and salvage it and run it in order to fund their, you know, what's left of their retirement years. Um, and, and I saw that with multiple people in my father's generation, and it really had an effect on me. Um, clearly made it so that I didn't want my kids to, my kids all worked in the industry, believe me. Whenever their grades went down, they ended up cleaning pools a little bit, and that kept them motivated to go to school, right? Um, you know, getting up at 4.30 in the morning certainly does that for a young man. Um, but. I never wanted them to be here full time because I was going to be responsible for my own retirement. I was going to be responsible for that. And that's, I set that goal for myself early on in my business career, um, that my children weren't going to fund my own stuff. So think of us, and again, there's 65,000 swimming pool com- service companies in the United States. If we each buy 1,000, we don't even put a dent in that number. Right. And, and none of us have, are, we're, we're in the dozens. None of us are in the hundreds even. So we are not going to put a dent in the number of swimming pool service companies in this go around, the next go around, maybe five or six go arounds, um, iterations of our businesses. We may have a tenth of the, of the, of the service companies, right? Um, so, that being said, there's always going to be room, as Wendy said, and we're all, we're all in it to maybe raise the bar a little bit of the industry, at least let clients know what's out there. Um, if there are some national players, then that might set a minimum level of expectations for a client, and so that I believe that's a good thing. Uh, the old phrase, you know, water raises all boats, so a rising tide raises all boats. So. Um, you know, I, I believe that that's something that our industry has needed for a long time. So yeah. I don't believe it's something to worry about. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I think uh, there's a great point by everyone. Um, view, my view is, as an industry, we are competing against other sectors such as residential and commercial HVAC, residential and commercial pest control for talent. And the struggle that everyone is facing today and has faced over the last couple of years especially is hiring technicians on the repair side, on the service side, and those people we are hiring out of other verticals in different service industries. The more um, professionalism that comes into our industry and the more capital that comes in, the more awareness there is and the more respectable of a career that the pool industry becomes, which it should be. And I view that that's going to help the independents, the mid players, the larger players all together. Um, and then in another area, for another example, is technology. The, the greater awareness of the, how attractive the pool industry is and the more capital that comes in again, the better technology that will, will be created. Um, there'll be more competition on the software side, which will create more availability of better software to operate everyone's business on the independent side and the larger players as well. And so I view that um, a lot of positive will come from this for everyone. Yeah, one thing early on in it, it I think mid-2020, right, when I started engaging in the idea of, of what this could be and, and, and trying to educate myself on what, what consolidation really was, right, because it was a completely foreign thing to me as a lifelong pool person. Um, the, it, we were thinking through, like all of us in this industry, right, we know that we have, are sort of the red-headed stepchild of the trades historically, right? Nobody, I'd be willing to bet very few people in this room grew up thinking they were going to be an adult in a career sitting in this room in the pool service industry. And we started thinking, like, why, why is that? And I think a lot of the, the sort of mature things in other, other trades that have, have given them more esteem are born out of large organizations that, in order to just sustain themselves, have to create, you know, training curriculums and software advancements and things that, you know, we would not be able to exist without, that those start to then impact the rest of the industry. 
um, and, and, are, and are reflected there uh, to the consumer as well, where, where that, that respect starts to get built as a trade. Um, so that was one thing that really stood out to me earlier. Um, the other thing in terms of, I think, maybe seeing consolidation as a threat versus an opportunity uh, as someone who's, who's operating a small business, because that was really important to me, right? When I, when I started to engage in this, it was, it was both selfishly and selflessly. Um, as it was clear in 2020, I'm sure all of you were getting private equity inquiries just like we were uh, as former owners. And going in, it was like, okay, so what is this, what is this going to mean for the industry? And, and so I joined to, to sort of shape what it would be, uh, whether you know, at the consulting stage, whether I was going to join or not, to make sure that, that the industry was going to be protected, right? Because this is what I'd spent my whole life doing. And I want to make sure if, if this is going to impact the industry, that it's going to be done in a way that, that I would be proud of and not, not be afraid of. And as we started drawing out sort of a plan for what, for at, at this point, you know, national pool partners would be, but I know this, this, this plays exactly the same with all three of us. Um, <clears throat> I started, so my, my company in Austin had about 45 people, uh, a little over $4 million business, right? And so the very first thing I, I did as we were coming up with this idea is draw out, okay, what does a, a 10 to $15 million location look like? And the, the, the people infrastructure within that organization was, was so much cooler than what I could do as a small business owner um, running a four and a half million dollar business in terms of the, the added functions, the added jobs, responsibilities. And then we take that, that one single location and then take, say take a, any large metro, whether it's you know, Dallas or Houston or something, say if you have four of those locations, the people infrastructure behind that, uh, of the jobs required to support that, those four unique locations. And then the state behind that and the added jobs created to support that entire state. And then the corporate level behind that. Seeing it like in real time, a career path that's never existed in this industry from pool cleaner all the way to executive that doesn't subtract at all from the entrepreneurial path to success that we all know this industry has had historically. All it did was add something new that was sort of a bonus to what we already have as an industry. Um, so that's what got me really excited. Um, and, and any fear factor I had about what consolidation was immediately went away because it was clear all this is doing is adding opportunity. It is not impacting any path to success that all of us already are familiar with from growing up in this industry. Hey, Pool Chasers. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed the episode. To connect with today's guests, including pictures, links, and resources from everything discussed today, you can visit the episode page at poolchasers.com or click the links below. To connect more with us, you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter by searching at Pool Chasers. If you would like to support the podcast, the easiest and most effective way is to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube, as well as share the show or your favorite episode with a friend or on social media. Also, you can get early access to each episode by supporting us through Patreon. We know your time is valuable, so thank you for sharing some of yours with us today. See you out there, pool chasers. chasers.